We are in the last chapter of 2 Timothy. So uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4 is where we're, we're at tonight. And uh, I know it's been a few weeks since we've been in there, you know, with different things of, uh, uh, you know, having Thanksgiving and then the week before doing the food baskets and those things, you know, as well. But we're going to conclude this. And then, like I said, next week we'll be starting our Nights of Christmas uh, that we'll have, um, you know, for the three Wednesdays here in uh, December. Now, obviously, uh, you know, let me give you a little background where we're at. In the, in the second epistle, the second letter that Paul writes to Timothy, Paul is, or sorry, Timothy is the uh, first ordained pastor of this church. This church was, uh, you know, uh, some believe that Paul started that church, but then Timothy took over, okay? And, you know, some believe that, some believe that Timothy is actually the one who started, you know, started the church. But this church is the church at Ephesus. The church that he is at, and if you ever read the book, of, or sorry, not, yeah, the book of Ephesians, you know that that church has some issues. And so Paul is writing to him, letting him know, and you'll, all throughout 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, he keeps talking about false prophets, false teachers, all those, you know, wolves in sheep's clothing. He keeps coming back and, you know, for all the time, but he always says, you know, whatever you do, stick to God's word. They're going to come in, they're going to try and, you know, tell you that you don't, you know, you know, that it's another way to get saved or it's another way. He says, you know what, stick to what God's word says. Don't believe what all these other people uh, say. And Paul is writing this to Timothy when he's in jail in Rome. He's in uh, jail in Rome and he's in there for the second time because uh, Nero had arrested him. If you don't know who Nero is, Nero is the one who helped uh, destroy the, uh, the temple in 70 AD. In 70 AD, uh, you know, when Jesus said that not one stone would be left upon another, Nero was the emperor that helped destroy that temple. And so he also uh, brought, uh, brought, uh, brought about huge amounts of persecution towards the Christians. That's why there was a lot of Christians at that time thought that the book of uh, Revelation was taking place because the uh, the persecution was so severe that they thought that, you know, that's what was happening, that revelation that, uh, um, you know, that was going on, that the end times of Jesus was getting ready to come back at that time. And so, but we know, obviously, you know, that not to be true, but that'll tell you about the intensity of the persecution that they thought, you know, that it was, it was so bad that they thought, well, Jesus is getting ready to come back. This is the second coming of Christ. And so let's read in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. It says, I charge thee before God, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they reap, up, uh, reap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they... Uh, and they shall uh, turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith, henceforth, there is laid up uh, for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all, uh, all them also that love his appearing. Do thy diligence uh, to come shortly unto me, uh, for, uh, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. And uh, Cretius uh, to... Uh, Galatia, Titus unto uh, Dalmeta. Only uh, Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring, hi, uh, bring him uh, with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And, uh, and uh, uh, Tychus have I sent to Ephesus. The cloak that I left at uh, Trosus with, uh, with Carpus, when, uh, when thou comest, bring with thee and the books, uh, and the books but especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did, much, uh, did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom be thou aware uh, also, for he, uh, for he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer, no man uh, stood with me, but all men uh, forsook me. I pray, uh, God, that it may, may not be laid to their charge. 
Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that, uh, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord, uh, the Lord shall deliver me from every good work, for, for every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Salute uh, Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphus. Erastus, uh, Erastus abode at Corinth, but uh, Trophimus have I left at uh, uh, Milet, uh, Miletum. Sick, uh, do thy diligence to come before uh, winter. Ebu, uh, Ebulus uh, uh, greeteth thee, and Putins and Linus and uh, Claudia and all the brethren, the Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, may you fill me with your Holy Spirit, that, Lord, that I would preach your word and not my opinion. And, God, that you would give us ears to hear, that the seed of your word would fall upon fertile soil, and that we'd not only be hearers of the word, but doers of the word as well. In Jesus' name, amen. And so when we look at these, uh, these different areas, over, like over and over again, it almost seems redundant with what uh, Paul is telling Timothy over and over again. He's telling him that there's going to be false prophets. There's going to be these false teachers. Preach the word. That because he, the reason why he has them preach the word is because when the false prophets come, because they will come in, when these false teachers and false prophets come in, when you preach the word, you'll expose their lies. That's the reason why he wants them to preach the word, because we can sit there with all of our opinions saying, my opinion says you're wrong. But when we go to God's word, which is the ultimate truth, is absolute truth, we know that whatever they say is not going to stand. A lie will not stand in truth, and they will be exposed for those things. And so Timothy, you know, it seems may not be a strong man, whether it's in body or in mind. He may not be a strong man in the fact that, you know, that um, because it's, if, we were look, if we're looking at the times where uh, Paul is exhorting him uh, to do these things, it seems as though that either in mind or body, he's not as, you know, as strong as Paul. But the fact is, is that he's a young, gentle soul that will, you know, may be more overwhelmed by Paul's uh, trial and impending death than, than, than Paul is himself. That the fact is, is that he sees his teacher, his mentor, getting ready to be you know, martyred for the faith, and it's, it's messing with them. I mean, to be honest, I mean, and if we know, uh, if, if we remember, Paul had a, a mom and a grandmother. Doesn't say anything about his dad. And so Timothy could be looking at Paul as like a father figure until, so he knows that like this father, you know, the spiritual father that he has is getting ready to die. That all the time that he's spent pouring into him, that, you know, that he's getting ready to go. And obviously we know that, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord right? But that oftentimes, you know, yes, it comforts us, but we still miss that person when they're gone, right? It's like a person that's put on hospice. We know that they're put on hospice, and, and, and people have gotten, you know, the, the hospice workers have gotten really good at kind of telling out, like, how long that person has before they, before they pass on, right? And the thing is, is that that's how it is right here. Paul knows that he's going, and so does Timothy, but Paul's not afraid, He's not afraid. We say, well, yeah, obviously he's the Apostle Paul. I can guarantee Paul wasn't going around saying, well, I'm the Apostle Paul. I don't have anything to be worried about. No, he just knew who he was in Christ. He knew that, you know what, in whom he had believed, and he said, you know what, God had promised that my salvation I can't lose. And so that's what we just need to, you know, uh, we need to realize is that when we look at these things, you know, on here. And so Paul, you know, had a, a steadfast heart and nothing shook him. And the thing is, is that's why he's also trying to uh, you know, speak encouragement into Timothy, because he knows what's going to happen. It's a foregone conclusion. He's sitting in jail. He's, he knows that he's going to be, he's going to be martyred for the faith. And by the way, Paul ends up dying by being beheaded in Rome. Um, and so he knows that's going to happen. He knows what's going to take place. And some people will sit there and worry themselves to death. And Paul knows, you know what, it's going to be but for a moment that I'm going to be with the pres- you know, I'm going to be in the presence of the Lord, right? And so that's why he's not worried about it. So in verses you know, 1 through 5, as we see this, as we read this, Paul's appealing to Timothy to fulfill his ministry. He's like, don't be like the others. Don't be like the ones that have deserted me. 
Don't be like the ones that have turned their back and got scared because of this world, that got caught up in the ways of this world. He's like, fulfill the ministry that God has given you. He's like, stay steadfast. Do not be moved. Do not be shook. But, you know, uh, but continue to fulfill that ministry that God has placed. And the thing is, is that as he begins to do that, he begins to, he begins to uh, you know, uh, talk about the sad prophecy of the coming dark days for the church. He said, you know what, there are, you know, in his day, there are already false prophets and false teachers. He says, you know what, it's going to get worse. And he's trying to warn Timothy. He says, you know what, I'm letting you know this so you're not surprised by it. He said, you shouldn't be surprised, but I want to let you know that, uh, that they're out there and they're going to try and come after you because they're going to try and go after a young pastor. They're going to try and go after somebody that's not as well-versed as maybe Paul is. I mean, you know, and most people say, well, not too many people are well-versed like Paul. Well, yeah, you know, he was a pretty smart guy, but that, that's no excuse for us to not study God's Word, right? We are to study God's Word. We are to, you know, learn from God's Word as well. And so, uh, you know, what we see here is um, that whether we are young or old, we are to study God's Word. We are to do it. Why? Because God expects us to. God's, you know, his word says what? To preach the word, be instant or urgent, in season, out of season. There's not an excuse for us to say, well, you know what? It just wasn't the right moment. That's, not, that's actually what it means. In season we, it would be, you know, somebody's asking how to get saved. Out of season would be, I got I to, gotta, you know, uh, change this conversation to spiritual things. That's what, you know, it, it would be. Like, you're not sitting there waiting for the perfect day, like how we talked about in Ecclesiastes, like you're not waiting for the perfect day to come out there and plant your seed. Well, the Bible says that we are, that we are to go uh, bearing precious seed, you know, um, as we go out and do it. And so and it, it talks about the fact of the harvest being plentiful, but the laborers are few. God wants us to go out and preach the word, whether it's, you know, somebody's ready to be saved at that moment or they're not ready to be saved at that moment because we don't know. We don't know when somebody's ready to be saved or not. It's always great when somebody walks up to us and says, hey, what can I do to be saved? Wouldn't you just love that if someone had, you know, just comes up to you and says, Tanya, what must I do to be saved? That's like a moment you're going, it's, it would almost take, it would almost like knock you off your socks because most people don't come up to you and say that nowadays. You got to work for it. But if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, what must I do to be saved? It's like, oh, I got this. I know, I know what to do here, right? And so, um, it's, and so in, the, uh, in this is, is the fact that I want, to, uh, I want us to understand uh, this, this one uh, gentleman, uh, McLaren, said this. He said, the master's eye must, uh, makes diligent servants. The tremendous uh, issues for the speaker and the hearer suspended on the gospel or the preaching of the gospel. If they were ever burning before our whether it be Kenneth Copeland, John Hagee, any of those guys, ever say, Lord, can you bless me with more souls that, you know, that get saved? Lead me to people so I can tell them about you so they can get saved. I've never, ever, and I used to watch them. I've never heard them ask you know, for more souls saved. It was always like financial blessings or like me, 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 me. It was never about advancing the kingdom of God making you know, or, or any of that. Why? Because... It's a, they're preaching a false gospel. They want you to believe that God just wants to bless you financially or to give you a Mercedes Benz or a, you know, a Lear Jet or whatever, but you can't enjoy any of that if you're sick. You can't enjoy that, you know, any of that if, I mean, I, you know, I shared this story before, but Kenneth Copeland, you can look at this up online. It was Hollywood edition. They asked him about, his, uh, about the, you know, the reason why he keeps on asking for airplanes and jets. And you get on there, and the man flat out said, well, you know, he said, I felt like the Lord. It wasn't the Lord, it was a demon. But he said, I felt like the Lord would ask me for, you know, uh, you know to say that I should pray, you know, for another jet and ask the people for another jet. You know the reason why? Because he didn't want to go on a coach flight, you know, with, with basically with the common folk, because then somebody would see him and recognize him and then ask him to pray for him. He said, you know, I'm supposed to be resting there and, you know, thinking about God's word, and then all these people would just start coming up to me and whatever. I said, yes, because, you know, you see Jesus, every single time that somebody came up to him, Jesus said, you know, why don't you just leave me alone? Oh, wait, no, Jesus never said that. But that's the reason why he wants it, because he doesn't want to be around people. But yet he wants your money. I mean, that's, 
And he came out, and on this Hollywood edition, this one lady asked him about it, and you could almost, I mean, you know what? If I'm lying, go look it up. I'm just telling you. She asked him about the plane and why he feels like he deserves it, almost like a demon manifests, and he gets, like, angry all of a sudden. Like, you could, I mean... I felt like in the video, maybe it was just the way that it, with the camera shot, but all of a sudden I felt like eyes turned black and everything else, and he like manifested a demon, and all of a sudden he just like caught himself, and then, you know, and then he just kind of put on his, his, his typical smile. But all these guys, like Jesse Duplantis and all those, all these, you know, guys that are on, you know, TBN or wherever they're at, they're all fake. They want people's money, and people will go out there and just, you know, give them money and everything else, and, and just... It's just crazy, all right? I'm just going to you know, stop with that and just say it, it's crazy all the stuff that people, um, you know, come, you know, uh, you know will do because they want to be blessed. Well, I am blessed. You know why? Jesus died for me. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's enough. I'm blessed. I, I'm saved because he died for me. You know, even if, even if I didn't get saved, I would still be considered blessed because he, he prepared the way for, you know, for that to happen. But people don't want that. They want money. They want the things of this world. They want all this. I don't want the stuff of this world. I know that I need, you know, that some of the stuff that you need, like food and a home and it may be transportation because you got to get around. But I'm not looking, you know, at, you know, having a Cadillac. I'm not looking at having a mansion or anything else. I'm looking at the fact of that what God has given me, he has blessed me with, and I'm not going to take that for granted. Far too long I took it for granted because, you know what, I watched some of those ones and I always felt like I had, I didn't have, you know, the best because I was somehow in sin. And that's how they'll, they'll talk to you. If you don't have the best, then somehow you're in sin and you need to repent of it. How do I know that? Because we had some, you know, at a previous church, one of the godliest people that I had ever met. Really sweet guy. And he was one of the deacons at that church. Came up and they're sitting around and they're, you know, and they're having a Bible study and he just all of a sudden just stops and he goes, I don't think my wife is in heaven. Just, and they're like, why do you think that? Well, you know, so-and-so, it was a previous pastor he was talking about. He said, so-and-so said that I had sin in my life and that that's the reason, you know, you know, she, you know she's probably in hell right now because, and he starts going on and on and, and one of the guys that says, you know, Stop. You're one of them, and just tells them, you and your wife were the most godly couple I've ever met. There is no way. That guy was, the guy, he stopped short of calling him a heretic, but he should have. And said, you know, because the guy said, you know, you need to start confessing sin from like back before you even knew that you, you know, that you committed a sin. So back when he was like a baby, maybe he like he accidentally like slapped his mom. Oh, that's a sin. So he's got to go ahead. I mean, and they're like confessing all this stuff trying to, so she gets healing. That is the dumbest stuff, you know, around. That stuff right there is the reason why people don't want to come to church anymore is because you have that false teaching, you know, coming out there and saying, you know what, that if you have sin in your life, that's the reason why you got cancer or that's the reason why, you, you know, this happened in your life or this. Or, yes, there are some times in your life where sin, do, you know, you sinned and that, you know, caused it, but it's not every single time. Sometimes life just happens. It, you know, and that's, you know, and that's the reality of the situation. You... You know why you maybe got cancer? Because maybe it's hereditary in your family. I mean, or why, you know, why did you get that car accident? Because you cut somebody off. I mean, it's those kind of things where people sit there and say, well, I must have had cinema. I mean, you have it down to, and I've met people like this, that stub their toe and believe that the devil made them do it. I'm like, no, you just were walking around in the dark and didn't see the chair. All right, I'm going to move on or else I'm going to keep on going on my rant here. I say those for Sundays and you know, try to stay away from them on Wednesdays. But in verse 2, as I said earlier, when he talks about being instant, uh, instant in season and out of season, he is saying at all times, all places, with or without opportunity, insist uh, it's just on urge uh, things in season, out of season. He's saying, you know what? If there's an opportunity, take it. Even if there's not an opportunity, take it. Because some people say, well, I don't want somebody to get mad at me. And, you know, you know what? If they get mad at you or whatever, then you say, you know what? I, you know, I'm sorry that you got mad. And then you just leave it at that. But you don't have to, like, keep going on it. But if, if they're resistant or they get mad or they punch you, then obviously if they punch you, then stop, you know. 
unless you feel like the Lord says keep going. But I'm just kidding. But in verses six, you know, six through eight, Paul is talking about him dying, that he knows that he is going to die, that he knows that he is going to die. And, uh, and uh, six through eight says, "For I am now ready to be offered." And the time of my departure is at hand. He's not taking a flight somewhere. He's not going out of town somewhere. He knows that he's getting close to being with the Lord. Verse 7 says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. May every single one that can hear this be able to say that statement when they come to the end of their life. That they could say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Oh, Lord, I pray that, you know, uh, you know, that I am able to make that statement, you know, when I take my last breath and say, Lord, you know what, I finished my course. I did what you would want me to do. It says, henceforth, henceforth there is, and this is the promise that we have, uh, henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And what does God say about those crowns that we're going to get? We're going to lay them down at his feet. But it says right here, it says, which the Lord... The righteous shall judge. What's that crown of righteousness? That's your salvation. He made you righteous when you got saved. Right? Because we are clothed in his righteousness and not our own. Because our righteousness is as filthy rags. It says, uh, shall give me at that day and not to me only. So he's saying, you know what? It's not for me. It's not just for me. Who is it for? But unto all them also that love his appearing all those who are saved he says you're going to get the same thing that i get god's going to give you a crown of righteousness when you uh, when you die or you die or you're raptured when you go up there he says you know i'm going to give you a crown of righteousness that's what that's our hope that's our promise besides the fact that we get eternal i mean there's a whole bunch of stuff that you get when you die but most people think well i just get heaven oh no you get a whole lot of stuff you know i mean there's I mean, just the fact that you're saved, God, you know, I mean, opens up the gates of heaven for you. And then there's a new heavens, a new earth. I mean, just amazing stuff, to, you know, to sit there and ponder and think about. And Paul, you know, when he's talking about this, he doesn't seem to care about the fact that he's desiring. He doesn't care about his desires, you know, or anything else. The only desire that he has and a longing for is the gospel that would be preached through Timothy. He's like, I, everything that I've taught you, I, I want to make sure that it keeps going. That you don't do like these other ones, as we're going to get to in here in a moment, where they said that they have left the faith or that they have you know, walked away or they got caught up in the ways of this world. He says, no, I want you to remain faithful. I don't want you, you know, in the face of adversity, to crumble. I want you to be able to stand and stand firm. And that's what we got to realize is that as as things get more and more evil and more and more wicked in these, uh, in these latter times, that God is looking, you know, you know, he wants us to stand firm in our faith. He doesn't want us to wither and wilt at the first sign of persecution. He wants us to be able to stand firm. Amen? And I know some of us get so scared about it and so nervous about it and everything else. But if we were to think about it like Paul did, he goes, you know what, I'm going to get my head. He, he probably had the idea because Rome was all about beheading people. And he probably sat there and thought about it. He, he may have been worried about it for, you know, for a moment or two or something. But he goes, you know what, when they do it, it'll hurt for about a second. And then I'm with the Lord. But it's like, why worry about those things that you can't control? What you can control is who you share the gospel with. What you can do is the fact of you taking your time out of your day instead of, and I'm preaching to myself when I say this, instead of turning on the TV, open, my, open up the Bible and read. Because the, reading the Word of God is going to do a lot for me, a lot more for me than watching TV. Amen? And, that, and that's what he's trying to tell us. He says, you know what, don't get caught up with all these other things around you. That's going to make you weaker. You need to go to God's word. Why? Because it's going to strengthen you. It's going to make you stronger. It's going to make you be able to stand up in that time of persecution. Paul is, in verses 9 through 11, Paul is longing for, uh, for Timothy to come see him. In verse 9, you know, he says, do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. 
Paul wants Timothy to see him before, you know, before he dies. Verses 10 through 11 says this, you know, or uh, he's, he goes through about all those that were close to him that have forsaken him. And that there are only a few that remain faithful to Paul. Let's read this. It says, you know, uh, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. He didn't lose his salvation. It's just the fact that, like, you know what? I'm tired of going through all the stuff that Paul goes through. And if you read all the stuff that Paul goes through, we all know that Paul pretty much, I mean, it seems like daily was like somebody was trying to kill him. And it seems like, you know, uh, you know uh, Demas here he said, you know what? I'm going to go over to Thessalonica and I'm just, I, I'm done with it. I'm done with all, you know, the people coming against us and everything else. And so he just backs away and says, you know what? I'm done. And Paul says that, you know, he forsook, he forsook me. And then, you know, talks about other ones going to Galatia. He even talks about Titus. Who is the next, cha- uh, next book, the next letter is written. Where does it say that, you know, because he's talking about those that have, um, you know, departed. It says that Titus went, uh, you know, it doesn't, say, it doesn't say whether or not he, uh, it, it, he implies that, you know, that he um, stepped away, you know, stepped away from the ministry for a little bit. But then in verse 11, it says, only Luke is with me. Who's Luke? Luke, the gospel of Luke, the physician. He says, he's the only one that's with me. I mean, Paul had, a, he had quite a few people around him. He had Silas. He had Barnabas. He had all these other ones. He, I mean, if you read his letters, he has people around him. And now he's saying, you know what? Only Luke is with me. So in other words, all these other people had looked at Paul and you know, maybe the, you know, the stuff he was preaching, that it was harsh and everything else, and they said, you know what? I love Jesus. I love you, Paul, but I can't take it anymore. They weren't able to withstand or stand up in the day of persecution. Luke is the only one left. And then what does he say? Uh, what does he tell him? He says, take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Well, who's Mark? Mark wrote the gospel of Mark. Mark wasn't always faithful, though. And now he is profitable. Now he does want him. We see this in, in Acts chapter 15, verses 38 through 39, where Mark, des- uh, he deserts Paul. Mark deserts him, and he goes, he goes off with Barnabas. Barnabas says, you know, I'm going to take care of him. Paul said, I don't want anything to do with him. He's of no value to me. He left me. He deserted me. I don't want him anymore. That's what Paul said. Obviously, that's not Jesus, because God's never going to leave us nor forsake us, right? But, he, but Paul says, you know what? I don't want him. He deserted me. Barnabas says, no, I'll take him. And Paul, Barnabas must have done something great, right? Because he's now, now Paul is asking for him. He's saying he's now profitable for the ministry. So when you begin to think about you know, those times, maybe you were in the ministry, and you had those times, and you said, you know what? I just messed it all up. There's no way. I can't do it. God's done with me. You know what? Nobody wants to, whatever. You know what? If Mark is able to do it, God's going to do it in you. He can make you profitable again. You may have deserted. You may have that regret. And you know what? Who's going to hold that over you? The devil. The devil's going to hold that over you and say, you know what? You left them. They're never going to want you back. They're never... this, is the st- this right here proves that, you know what? You could be profitable again for the ministry. Just because you messed up in the past does not mean that you got to let that you know, uh, you know, dictate the rest of your life. You can be profitable, but how are you going to be profitable? Get back into God's word. Begin to do those things. And you know what? You, you know, begin to do you know, the work of the Lord. Go out and knock door to door. Begin to talk to people about Jesus. Begin to you know, volunteer around the church. Begin to do all those things. And God says, you know what? You can be profitable again. I'm not telling you to like, burn yourself out. I'm telling you that you can be profitable again in whatever way God has, uh, has equipped you. And, and most people think that they have to have a special gift in order to go... Um, you know, go uh, knocking door to door or anything else. No, you don't. If you don't want to speak, there's a thing called silent partner. You can pray for the person that's preaching the gospel. But we are to go, you know, the Bible, when it says you know, pr- go and preach the gospel, it doesn't say, you know, if you're only if you're a pastor or only if you're a deacon, it says for us to go, all of us are supposed to go. And that would be one way, you know, people can be, uh, you know, can be, uh, get back to being profitable is the fact of going to preach the gospel and see people saved. Amen? 
Got a little quieter on that part. But like I said, Paul, uh, Mark deserted Paul, but now he's profitable to him. And here, the next thing you see in verses 14 and 15 is that we see Alexander the coppersmith withstood uh, uh, Paul's preaching. What does that mean? He stood up against it. He didn't like what Paul was preaching. He absolutely, you know, he absolutely uh, you know, uh, hated you know, what Paul was preaching. I mean, what, what does it say? It says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. And how does Paul respond? Does he say, you know what? Oh, man, he hurt my feelings. You know, I'm, I'm going to shed a tear because I'm going to go over in the corner because he did much evil to me. Read the next part of it. What does he say? The Lord reward him according to his works. Because Paul knows as many as he loves, he rebukes and chastens. And the thing is that he will chasten somebody in order to get them back. And he's saying, you know what? Paul is telling him right here. He's not, I'm not saying that you know, Alexander is saved. I'm saying the fact that Alexander could, you know, could be not saved. And the fact that he says that the Lord reward him according to his works. He's doing it so that way maybe that person goes, maybe Paul was right. Maybe I do need to believe on the Lord. Maybe I do need to get saved. But we oftentimes will sit there and begin, you know, think that we did something wrong and the other person did evil to us. And we go around trying to mend that relationship back and forth. But the issue is, is that what we need to do is say, you know what? The Lord reward them according to their, you know, to their works. So that they can come back you know, to the gospel. We don't necessarily need to be sitting there um, you know, crying over spilt milk. Because they're the ones who spilled it. Right? It's getting even quieter now. It also, he goes on and says, Of whom be thou aware, or beware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words or our preaching. Greatly. What does that mean? There's probably yelling going on. There's probably the fact that we him going around and, 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 and speaking all kinds of you know, evil against Paul. I've come over there and say that guy's a heretic. He doesn't know what he's talking. He's preaching, you know, this, you know, uh, you know, preaching that, you know, uh, salvation is easy. He's doing all. I mean, he's going out there. Paul doesn't know what he's talking about. He's all that learning that he did is gone to his head. Didn't, weren't they doing that before? They were telling Paul that he, that he was mad because his much learning had caused him to go nuts, had caused him to go insane. So he could be going, you know, doing the same thing. Alexander could be doing the same thing, saying, "Don't listen to him." And there are people that will do that when you're preaching the gospel. We've met people. Mary and I, you know, and my wife and, and Lily, when we've gone out, there have been people who will walk with us trying to oppose as we're trying to tell somebody the gospel. Am I, am I lying? So what we're seeing in the Bible is what we see, you know, nowadays, is that somebody, you know, people will follow around and, and try to get you I mean, and you know Miss Mary ain't going to lie for me. She'll tell you the truth. And they will go all around, I mean, you know, uh, you know, trying, you know uh, trying to get, no, don't listen to him. He doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, they're trying to do this. The Jehovah's Witnesses is love us. Here's the other part that we, you know, we got to see here. In verses 16 through 18 goes along with what, uh, what Jesus told Paul when he first got saved. Acts chapter 9, verse 16 says, For I will show him how great things, uh, how great things he must suffer for, for my name's sake. That's what, that's what Jesus said. I mean, of course, you go along with the prosperity preachers and all that. They'll say, you know, unless you have money, that you're, you know, you're somehow in sin. But what did he say? He says, you're going to suffer for my name's sake. He didn't say you're going to have a, you know, be living in a mansion. He tells that to Paul. And in verse 18, it goes, uh, verses 16 through 18, it goes along with it. It says, at my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray, uh, I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. He is, he's, he's almost, he's like, he's mirroring Jesus' life. Paul would tell you, obviously, he's not, you know, he's not perfect. But what does he say? He said, everybody has left me. Well, didn't they do the same to Jesus? But what did Jesus say? Father, forgive them, for they not know what they do, right? So what does Paul say here? He says, I pray that God may not, uh, may not be laid, uh, that it may not be laid to their charge. 
same thing. Because why? They're doing it in ignorance like they did upon the cross, when Jesus was on the cross. Verse 17, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that uh, by me the preaching might be fully known, and that uh, all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Now, this, that part of the, the, he was delivered out of the mouth of the lion could be literal or figurative. He could be talking about a situation that he went through that it felt like he was being delivered to the lions. But at the same time, there was a Roman Colosseum that was going on where they would take these Christians and put them in there. That's what the Roman Colosseum was made for. People are like, oh, I wonder what happened there. They put Christians in there with lions, and people sat there and watched Christians get eaten alive by lions. So that could be you know, a, a very literal thing. I, I tend to believe that it's a literal thing, that literally that he, got, he was delivered from the mouth of the lion, that he was in there and somehow or another God stopped the mouth of the lion like he did with Daniel. Verse 18 says, And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so what we see in here is the fact that, um, like I said, that he seems to be going through a lot of the same sufferings as what Jesus did. Jesus told him he was going to suffer a lot. He did suffer a lot. There's a lot of things that were mirroring his life and Jesus' life. That, that when, when he was sent to die, everybody left him. Same thing with Paul. But here's the last, you know, in that last part in verse 18, this is, this is how we get to see Paul's attitude, and he knew he was not perfect. Because people say, well, Paul said he was perfect. No, Paul did not. There's times where people, you know, uh, misconstrue or, mis- or uh, you know, take what, uh, you know, something and they twist it. But read what he says in verse 18. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. If Paul's perfect, then how does he have evil works? How? That means Paul is still sinning, just like we do. Like he writes in Romans, the things that I want to do, I don't do, and the things I you know, do, uh, you know, do want to do, I don't do, right? He's saying that God's going to deliver him. Why? Because he is clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That when, you know, there's this, mis, you know, uh, there's this, this, this thought nowadays, this, this uh, heresy out there that says that when you sin, you lose your salvation. Well, which sin causes you to lose your salvation? Do you ever notice it's a sin that you don't deal with? Because it has to be the big major sin. But the Bible never says that. The person, you know, that says that they can lose their salvation will say, well, if I murdered somebody... I could lose my salvation. Or, you know, if I, you know, I mean, the only sin that is not forgive, you know, forgivable is, you know, the unpardonable sin, which is what? If you're a reprobate. You can't lose your salvation. Because some people will say, well, if, you know, I sat there, like I've told you this before, early in my early uh you know, in my Christian life, I would wake up at like two or three o'clock in the morning and like just pouring in sweat because somehow or another I had a dream about something, you know, something that was bad. And I thought that that, because I I dreamt it, that that was sin and was going to send me to hell. So I'd wake up terrified and go look to see if people around that I knew that were saved, if they were still there. Because why? I didn't want the rapture to happen because I had a bad dream. You say, that's silly. But that's how people get. If your salvation depended upon you, you would mess it up. But the Bible says that there is, in no wise, can you be cast out. That you can never be plucked out of his hand. Never. So what does that mean? You can't lose it even if you wanted to. But you won't want to. Why? Because you're saved. Why would you want to lose it? And if a person comes up and says, well, I used to serve Jesus, but now I don't. They never did. Oftentimes, people that come up there and say, you know, I was saved, but, you know, I just left that behind and whatever. They were never saved in the first place because they came with the wrong motives. 
You say, well, how can you judge that? Because, you know, the fact that and there, you'll meet people that are saved that, like, just said, you know, I wanted to go do things like these ones in here. There were the ones in here that were saved, that were in the ministry, that were helping Paul. And what did they do? Things got too hot for them, so they left the kitchen. Just like Mark. But Mark, what, they're, you know, what is being described is a, is a backslidden Christian. It's somebody who is backslidden. It's not somebody who lost their salvation. And that's how Mark is able to come back and be profitable for the ministry. Because what does the Bible say? That if, if you sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin. God knows that you're going to do it. But if you can show me a verse that says that this verse right here will, I mean, go, I mean, I'm not trying, I'm not saying this arrogantly. Show me in the verse in the Bible that says that if you do this certain sin, you lose your salvation. And I don't say that, you know, cocky or arrogant. I haven't found it. But I do, you know, see God's word say over and over again that if you believe on him, you have life that you have everlasting life, that if you believe in him, you know, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Nothing in there ever says, but if you do this, bye-bye salvation. If you have that mentality and that focus, the reason why, you know, that's the reason why oftentimes people get so, ner- and, you know, so nervous about things because they're so, their Christian walk does, is not even freedom anymore. It's because they're afraid to do anything. They would rather stay at home, lay in bed, but then if they did that, that's the sin of laziness. Even and the Bible says that even the thought of foolishness is sin. So which sin sends you to hell when you're saved? None. You do have to like ask God, you know, say, God, you know, forgive me of that sin. So that way you don't like just let it linger and let it sit. And so that way you, you get into, you know, you go on worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. It's like a person that when they're a kid, they never get in trouble. So they keep doing it. And they keep doing it. And that's the reason why the kid, you know, says, you know what? I never thought that I would ever end up in jail. Because they were never punished for it. They always thought they got away with it. They never had to deal with it until they got into jail. God will use those things around us, though, because he's a loving God. He want, he's, he's not willing, you know, willing that any should perish, whether, you know, if that person, if a person is not saved, he's not willing that they should, per, uh, that they should perish, but they all should come to repentance. What does that mean? That they should turn to him, that they should believe on him. And if a person is backslidden, that's why he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, that my sheep know my voice, Right? Let's pray.